Greetings everyone. As most of you are aware, my history with games has been fairly limited but diverse. I've played most types of games from FPSs, RTSs, adventure games, RPGs, puzzle games like Mist and Riven, uh, those types of games, racing games, fighting games, Souls games, and party type games like Mario Party and so on. Uh, however, most of those were from days gone by. Nowadays, I've settled into somewhere of not very Souls games, but sort of Souls games, but not really anime action RPG. It's a strange place, but because I've left uh, the past 20 years of StarCraft behind me for games I really enjoy due to my personal preferences. So this review, not review, will all be from my perspective of what I enjoy during my time off work when the kiddos are asleep. So as it's 2023, do I need to tell you that I'm going to spill the beans here and spoil all the surprise? If so, then here's the quickie review. This is a fantastic game that can only get better from here. I'd probably give it a 9 out of 10 or so. If there's substantial additions, this will be one of my favorite games I've ever played. It's available on Steam for the PC folks as far as I know. The gameplay here in the background that you're watching is my final boss fight in the search for 100% map completion. Okay. Now on to the nitty gritty of what I found. Frontier Hunter displays a very wide variety of characters to choose from during the gameplay. There are three playable characters with a host, a very wide host of supporting personalities to aid the adventure. These NPCs range from cooks, blacksmith types, quest givers, friends, haberdashers, analysts, and more. As this is in early access, not all of the NPCs were at their fullest potential. That's what I gathered. However, there was enough given to understand what a full game could be like at launch next year. All the characters offer their own interesting flair as you get to read or hear each dialogue option. They each offer valuable information or options as progression is made. If there has been no progression, each character will continue the same dialogue loop. It's pretty interesting to note that each NPC will return to their original dialogue speech loop after everything has been completed. If these could be updated to continue discussing your progression somehow, it would make it feel more friendly and connected to the main character. But there's still lots of time before main launch, you know? The three playable characters are Ezra, the main character and motivating protagonist, Tiara, the fun-loving sidekick who's in love with Ezra, it's pretty hilarious, and a mysterious third who harbors a dark past, secrets, and incredible power. These three sojourners forge an unbreakable bond that allows them to face adversity together. This has a very anime arc built into it. I love the character traits that are displayed throughout the levels. As qualm, cool, and collected as Ezra is, Ciara is her exact opposite. Bubbly, light, vibrant, and full of exuberance. These two are quite funny to watch as they continue their search. I'll leave our third friend for your discovery when you get the game to try for yourself, but I think you'll be quite pleased. As the characters are switchable on the fly during gameplay, it creates a very fluid and natural transition that takes a bit of comfort before becoming proficient. There's a slight amount of cooldown between character swaps, which is signaled by a very annoying buzzing sound. This is exceptionally important to understand before embarking too deep into the boss encounters. Each of the characters bring something unique and special to the team. Ezra chooses to wield spears and short swords for close to medium range combat with a few limited options for extending her reach. For Tiara, she's very much on the ranged end of the spectrum with few options for close quarters. However, make no mistake that once her move pool is updated fully, she can choose either her devastating boots or her cannons as viable options. Our third adventurer, you'll see her gameplay in the background at certain times, sports fists and knives for very close range with crazy options for builds that make her near invincible. We'll discuss that more a little later. But since this is my channel, I'm always interested in breaking the game with the most ridiculous combinations imaginable. So this game is right up my alley. As this game has a very anime bent to it, you can believe that there is a story. The story does not leave much to the imagination, as most everything necessary to know and understand is expressed in cutscenes. That being said, perhaps it's because of early access or just more focus on making great gameplay, the story simply exists and moves on. There's nothing spectacular to miss or gain from the entire storyline. 
Nothing to remember, nothing to continue forward, but nothing of consequence if things were missed. As I do enjoy a great story to feel connected with the characters, to feel as if I'm experiencing what they experienced, you know? The gameplay is so involved in min-maxing the characters. Therefore, I tend to forget about the story elements and feel as if I'm crafting my own characters and generating their own story for which everything I'm continually searching. There's so much time to spend in this game pushing the characters to their absolutely bonkers limits that the story is fairly forgettable, but not in a bad way. Typical encounters are of what I would think of as normal story elements, like here's a widget, must find more, a boss guards them, must kill the boss, and then repeat. So story-wise, there's not a whole lot going on. From what I gathered, we're adventurers that have crash-landed on another island. Uh, kingdoms and empires have come and gone. Some empires were global rulers, while others were localized. Most have never met a global empire ruler, of which Ilk Ezra is most certainly, because anime and plot deem this to be so. In spite of all this, it simply makes for some interesting scenes, but doesn't impact gameplay in the least bit. And this is why I'm happy with it being where it is. I wouldn't want the story writers to force something into the developments which detract from where the game is now in early access. Storytelling is one medium for conveying the world and story arc. However, the visuals are exceptionally gorgeous. The NPCs, characters, and enemies are all of a cell-shaded nature, while the backgrounds, platforms, and foreground elements seem as if they are watercolor-based paintings, which have been sharpened up. It's a fantastic contrast between the two parts that help to quickly and visually recognize what is a destructible element, what's an enemy, or what's a platform. There are several times where jumping from platform to platform becomes a little bit confusing because of the blend between the 2.5D background foreground transition. It's not always blatantly clear which is an available position to which to jump. All that being said though, this is early access and still an incredible experience. I don't know if the art style would work well for generating a smooth and relaxing environment, which was quickly understood. I'm happy to say that the subtleties of which I spoke earlier are quickly overcome due to the comfort level rising with the character movements. The visual experience is wonderful, as all the regions of the game are bright, well lit, and visually engaging. Even the dark, cavernous areas, if you will, are they're well lit enough, and that adventuring through them is not tedious or painful. There's no reason to like adjust your monitor brightness or contrast to compensate for poor development, you know? It's just amazing how it actually is visually. The amazing visual treat of the levels is boosted further by a rock-solid audio performance. This absolutely includes music, enemy audio cues, weapon sounds, utility signals, level ups, traversal, motion, ambient chatter, and much more. Each level of the entire game has a memorable sound and audio track, and some of these levels I actually kept on going back through just to look for secrets because I wanted to hear more of the music. The tracks are subtle but enjoyable, engaging and motivating while not being overbearing. They're always present but not overpowering to the other audio topics listed previously. And it's nice as well that when the menus come up, the music fades ever so slightly to the background in a very soothing manner. Whoever the audio engineer is overseeing the oral experience of the game has done a masterpiece. I can't say enough good things about the enjoyment levels I have while playing this game because of enjoying the sounds in my ears. Every single enemy in the game has a unique jingle, a tick, a buzz, a flap, or a pound that tips you off to what you're going to encounter before the next screen transition. This is so helpful or dreadful. If there's a new enemy, you know it before even seeing it. If there's something you're trying to farm, you know it. If there's something that you've seen before, you're prepped how to deal with it before it happens. There's even a sound effect for nearing death. It's obvious and jolting, but not distracting from the action at hand. It's so masterfully done to assist the player without being invasive or annoying. There are some crazy sound effects that I'll talk about a little later that are just incredible. When they are heard, you know you've done something awesome. This game simply doesn't disappoint in the audio category. I wholeheartedly recommend this game simply just to experience the audio majesty. 
As I stated previously, the game is available on Steam, and I think it's fairly discounted right now. Maybe it went back up uh, for all the PC crowd to enjoy. I'm currently running a GTX 1080 overclocked on a 1440p panel. Uh, the monitor is a photo editing panel capped at 60 frames, but the visual quality is impeccable. So it's not some crazy burden on the graphics card, but I get a pleasing enough experience that I can't complain. There was never once a jitter, stutter, crash, dropped frames, or a game stopping event that caused the game to slow down at max settings. Not that there aren't many settings to increase, but the ones that there were, I maxed them all out with no detracting performance hits. The game runs exceptionally smooth and is very responsive to inputs. Uh, for the first time in 20 years, I plugged in a controller to play the game. It was a wireless controller with only one dropout because the controller lost connection. Other than that, gameplay is very dependable with no interruptions to the immersion. IGN 21 out of 10 would recommend for those looking for a solidly built game that offers nothing except a fantastic single player experience. Now, I mentioned there are no slowdowns, however, there is a unique feature, and I don't know if it's intentional, which occurs when multiple enemies are killed at once with a unique move. This has a louder than normal kill sound with a slightly enhanced version of the audio for the move. The screen slows a little, enemies die in slow motion, and the character continues to the end of the move animation with about one quarter of the speed that they normally would. Uh, the entire experience of such an occurrence happening encourages the player to continue trying for multi-kills because of the sheer adrenaline rush that happens. It's so exhilarating. This experience gives the sense of, I have no idea what's happening, but I'm destroying everything. <laughs> uh, the game allows you to feel powerful, and these slowdowns feel tactical and purposeful from the developer's point of view. It translates very well to the experience as enemies are dying and there's no follow-up danger when this occurs. It's one of the most satisfying developments I'm experiencing in the game. To, exp to extend this feeling of intense power further, the game allows you to continually find new moves for each character and each weapon. Each of the various weapon sets have basic move sets that begin the game. However, there are hidden, or maybe not so hidden, uh, books that are around the map which generate a new button combination to press to execute devastation on the enemies. This is not important to remember these combos immediately if you are familiar with fighting games. Uh, typically in fighting games you have to learn things really quick and then execute immediately. But they do help to understand what to do when those weapons are equipped. The enemies are fully capable of being dispatched with basic moves, but the style of the advanced set makes it so worth it to be an anime blaze of power. Learning these moves comes with time, but that's perfectly natural as most of them are found mid to late game anyways. So you'll have plenty of time in between each discovery to become intimately familiar with each move set, and believe me, they're exciting. As each of the moves are fairly flashy and satisfyingly pulverizing, there's one move which stands out head and shoulders above the rest. Sierra's Machine Gun Special. This move single-handedly destroyed four bosses for me without switching characters or doing any other attack. It's so amazing of a boss killer, uh, you can see during the head fight uh, how much damage it's doing, that you won't want to miss it. Definitely pick it up because the damage output is absolutely insane. I'm not saying this to nerf it or anything, uh, I'm just mentioning because I love finding the most powerful combinations and destroying everything with them. I applaud the developers for placing this into the game because Vulcan cannons typically are overlooked for their devastating firepower. I believe this does it justice in an anime fashion. Well done. The world offers an intense amount of items to collect. There are items for literally anything and everything you do or don't care about. Most of the items that I come across are from the enemies that are deleted in my path. However, there are chests, energy ups, destructibles, hidden walls, and paraphernalia lying around ripe for the picking. There are so many items to collect that it's positively overwhelming upon first exposure. It definitely takes time to understand everything that's on display, but that seems typical for a new game, right? Everything's new at the beginning. This definitely adds to the learning curve. As I neared the end of the early access, uh, 
I finally started to understand what upgrade materials were required for each piece of armor, accessories, and weapons. The trouble became what enemy to contact for these items, where to find them, and then how to find the optimal farming path to quickly load up on upgrade materials. The farming routing was exceptionally enjoyable for me though, uh, since watching these enemies evaporate in front of me is so satisfying, I never minded the farming. There's one part in particular that I'll deal with later, but overall a great experience. The farming will be exceptionally important as the game opens up beyond early access. There are hours and hours of time able to be spent on each weapon, armor, or accessory to understand what's necessary for upgrades. This is an insanely fun system that will take time to appreciate. Farming is typically not a favorite from what I've gathered amongst peers and others, but it seems to be a fairly painless activity here due to the very agreeable drop rates. It's not Borderlands levels of drop chances, but rather about one material every other run or so. It's possible to farm up about 30 of whatever you need in the right places in about 15 minutes or less, so it's not a lot of time commitment. The difficulty involved is finding where to go in order to find the optimal spots. Overall, it's a pretty great system that allows multiple returns uh, to every area to farm up whatever materials or cores that you deem necessary. The game does not block any previous progression once you pass through it, so it's so very nice that way. It's not like you're locked out of something. Also, a bit of a side note, the blue energy up spheres that are attacked, uh, they increase depleted energy while at the same time being a farming spot for different utility items. It's really important to farm these occasionally for some powerful, powerful, insane utility items. It's not obvious at all what they are for upon first realization, but time will show you that patience and farming will reward you with insane value in this game. The weapons and accessories I've been explaining that need a bunch of farming for upgrade materials are varied, interesting, and very, very powerful. Every weapon and accessory in the game is definitely in the category of needing to be collected <laughs> in order to see how they interact with the rest of the collection. This is like my adventure in Elden Ring all over again, collect everything. So many weapons and accessories to engage with that I never felt as if I fully tapped out the potential of any one weapon or accessory. That's a fantastic place to be. There's also not enough materials here in the early access to fully max out certain uh, accessories or different weapons. Since some of the weapons are upgraded from boss materials, this leads me to believe that later on in the game, after early access is over, certain bosses will be regular or less leveled enemies or something of this kind. That being said, there are upwards of 100 plus enemies in the game, so there's no fear of boring encounters that never offer something new. The weapons definitely are complicated enough to engage analytic folks like me, while also being simple enough to appeal to wider audiences without being annoyingly overwhelming. They can be simple and basic as get sword, swing sword, or it can be hours of min-maxing, of which I've already partaken at this point. Go figure, right? <laughs> uh, everything, for the st uh, everything for the stats and such is fairly straightforward on the main status screen, which is nice. Figures go up and down when highlighting different options so it can be easily understood, which is better. Then it's up to you to decide what is more important, stats or core slots. Magical cores are small, whitish orbs that are dropped occasionally from enemies upon defeat. These cores change the characteristics and bonuses of each weapon, accessory, or armor. All these changes are reflected across your single character that is attached to those pieces. This means that if a sword, a ring, and the armor all have different passive abilities, they all benefit the character. There's no restriction on how these passive abilities are reflected on the character performance. However, none of the passive abilities can be stacked with multiple cores on pieces worn by the character. So you can't put two or three of the same thing and get, you know, 50% increase. This is fantastic as each core has a unique grid layout requirement. Each piece of weaponry, armor, or accessory has an allowable potential for core slots. So some weapons are a 4x2 grid, like 4 columns, 2 rows, which also allows for a total of 8 total core slots, uh, but configured in a very specific orientation. This makes the building process exceptionally dynamic and intriguing as time goes on. 
These cores are dropped from anything and everything that can be shot, punched, blown up, or sliced. The bosses drop some pretty insane cores that allow for regenerating health, health armor, increased defenses, and so much more. At first, this seems fairly simple to understand, you know, you get the cores, you put them in. However, time is required to understand 100 plus cores and how they will interact with each other. Also, it's tied to the upgrade material conundrum in order to un unlock new core slots to take full advantage of the piece's potential. These cores are plentiful enough that engagement begins as soon as the game starts, which is very nice. But mastering this is as long and as engaging as the player wishes. As the game progresses, bosses will stand in the way of progression. These bosses offer powerful cores as I already stated, so the incentive is in exceptionally high to engage immediately with each boss encounter. The bosses are memorable, and all with varied movesets that feel nothing similar to each other. However, with Ciara's machine gun tech, many of them are deleted so quickly before being allowed to even show off their true power. However, the design of each boss is very enjoyable to see. The monster dictionary shows them as not being anything like any other enemy, which is very acceptable in my opinion. So it's very easy to remember them or understand when there's a boss enemy. All of the bosses provide a unique upgrade mechanic to the player's core movement abilities to provide access to more areas previously blocked. It's a nice way to make the game a little more linear, but I'm sure the speedrunning community <laughs> will find a way to break this wide open as we get out of early access. This game has way too much potential to enjoy a speedrunning scene that I can't imagine folks like Oats and Goats and such completely turning a blind eye to this later on. Most of the bosses are representations of things we all know in real life, like scorpions, bats, faces, etc. Uh, but they are given moves that make everything memorable and unique. Uh, each of the arenas that are fought with the bosses are all very basic and similar. Uh, they're like flat areas that you are locked into and you can only jump, dash, or take damage. So not very inspired as far as arena interactions, but still enjoyable. The boss fight itself is fairly simple. Strike the boss enough to deplete all the health bars, and you win. However, there's another bar on the boss that is a break bar. Quote unquote break bar. It's like a stamina bar in a sense. If the break bar is depleted, the boss will go into a hard stagger state where you should be able to unload massive amounts of damage quickly. So there's a timing mechanic kind of built into the fight of decision making about when to save your utility spam or weapon moves to optimize your attacks. Again, speedrunners probably won't care about this and simply try to steamroll at any, any level regardless of boss mechanics, uh, but this is exceptionally enjoyable to know when or how close the boss is to a quote unquote break point, you know? It's valuable information that helps alert the player to the situation. The boss fights are probably the easiest topic to understand in the entire game. Nothing earth shattering, but I enjoy each of these bosses in their own ways. Alright, a little bit about exploring this map. Uh, the levels leading up to the boss fights are ever winding and engaging. Exploring these areas is easily, easily the best part of the game. Trying to find 100% of the map completion is so amazing that it just keeps you going to see what else is out there. There are hidden rock walls, secret jumps, high leaps of faith, and so much more to find. Everywhere is available to explore, but there are definitely progression blocks along the way. Some of these blocks are truly impassable until further notice. So it's very pleasing to be fully running around to then realize that there's truly no way forward until the boss of the area unlocks a new movement ability to allow progression. Very simple, but it's a very strong tried and true mechanic that I very much appreciate. Each level is highly unique and shares nothing with the other areas. So the map is color coded to each area, but there's also a unique audio track, unique visuals, different enemies, and different pickups. So exploring and re-exploring all the areas of the game is almost necessary uh, to fully unlock all the secrets and potentials that this game has to offer. I highly recommend going for 100% map completion in order to enjoy the beauty of exploring this little world. Upon exploring this world and collecting the magical cores during travel, it will become apparent time will need to be invested in order to maximize character potential. The various amounts of builds in this game are insanely vast, 
Just like in Code Vein, you quickly realize what is worth building and keeping, or what is worth discarding. Towards the end of the game, I was starting to realize just how powerful some of these builds could be. There are builds that I'm using where the character has health regen, a health shield, increased defenses at low health, increased stats at low health, which are multiplicative, health stealing upon attack, sleeping, which is like stunning the enemy, poison, time bobs, and increased energy regen. It's insane. I know you don't know what all of that means, but if you play the game, you'll understand that all of that on one character is just absolutely insane. This turns the character into a crazy weapon that simply doesn't even need to fight and cannot be killed. There's a weapon, or a utility I should say, in the game that we pair all of this with and we can just sit there and enemies die. It's insane. The amount of builds that can be created rivals that of Vayne itself. I can definitely see myself playing this game far into the future if there is a strong endgame. However, the early access is not without its crazy glitches and such, obviously. There are several movement bugs where a character will enter an animation locked state halfway into the floor, which cannot be broken unless the character dashes wildly in any direction. This can typically happen upon screen transitions, but are overcome easily enough. It's very annoying though during combat to get stuck and take immense damage without ability to move. Since most of the moves are on frame cooldowns from each other, it's possible to get stuck for a few seconds this way. There are some hitbox detections which are debatable during dashing. Uh, sometimes the directions get locked with the analog control stick. Um, sometimes moves are not executed due to movement locks, so on and so forth. But I guess, you know, these are to be expected during early access, so I'm not worried and won't dwell on these beyond just minor annoyances. In all fairness, the game runs very smoothly with the knowledge that it's not even fully released or completed yet, you know? So I'm completely not even going to harp on these anymore. It's just something that I noticed during my play. It seems that I've become passionate about this game almost overnight. In as much as I'd like to see this game succeed, I can already see some quality of life improvements which would definitely uh, increase the player's access and agency during each section of the game. For starters, there needs to be a location description in the bestiary for each of the different monsters. It's nice they list what each enemy drops so you can find materials, but there's no way to know where to go. Having location access in the bestiary would enhance the player's willingness to run back out real quick to farm up some unique materials. Uh, in the upgrade screens, it's very helpful to know what elements are used for upgrading. However, in the upgrade screen, right next to the material, it would be exceptional to know what enemy drops, what material in parentheses or something, like for the formic acid, and then have right next to it in parentheses what enemy drops that. That would be super helpful. This way, the only reason to go to the bestiary would be to know the locations, and then you could see the drops in there as well. Having the drop potentials related directly on the upgrade screen would enhance the player's speed at recognizing which materials are needed, uh, from which enemy is the drop, and where do I need to go to find it. I do hope that the boss materials are farmable in the future, as we get closer to full release. It would be pretty horrible if there are weapons, accessories, and armor, which can never be fully upgraded. To this end, it would be super enjoyable if the bosses could be farmable or repeatable in some way, but they have increased movesets and changes uh, made to their movement pattern, maybe? Uh, this way the bosses could be enjoyed multiple times. To this end, I would also like to throw in some of my own wishes and dreams since it's still in the development phase, albeit a barely completed version, right? It would be amazing to have a method of farming up money. There's currently no dedicated drop location so far that can be uh, dropping large amounts of money, therefore upgrading and building new items becomes exceedingly difficult. If there could be a time, cha time trial challenge arena to farm up money or something like that, it could be a challenge based tier system but an enjoyable method of utilizing all those overpowered builds. Who knows? As I stated earlier about finding material locations, uh, it would be very enjoyable to have locations of utilities listed as well. For example, if you find a mosquito beam somewhere, uh, then there should be a listing, like in the bestiary, showing locations of where to farm for that utility later on. If you want to go back to a certain screen and hit the little energy ups, and you can start farming out uh, multiples of each of those uh, utilities. That would be helpful and useful. 
Uh, I do wish there was a method to be able to consume food on the go. Uh, being able to only consume food at a save point seems very likely that food will never be a major part of engagement. If the food was more accessible, it would be enjoyable to use it up more often, like a portable kitchen or something. I ended up with a thousand ingredients that I just sold off for my lack of money. <laughs> uh, you know, back to my uh, first point there. I'm sure there are a million other things, but if the game is to succeed, the end game needs to be exceptionally strong. There needs to be some sort of method of utilizing the overpowered builds and testing the player to the maximum. This shouldn't be a requirement for completing the game or such, but it should be available for folks to test the limits. Well, that does it. When I started playing the game, I wasn't quite sure where to put it in my lineup. I thought it would be like a 7 out of 10 or so, I even said as much in my first stream. Uh, but to my surprise and happiness, this is quickly rising up my list of favorites. I mean, look, I'm making a video discussing my findings here with you guys. There's nothing more enjoyable than finding a hidden gem like this and being thoroughly surprised and impressed. I would highly recommend this game to you guys if you enjoy the exploration, building, farming, min-maxing, anime waifus, and over-the-top flashy combos, this game is definitely worth your time. If not, and you made it this far, I thank you very, very so much for your attention and time. I'm fully amenable to the idea of being able to agree to disagree. But for everyone else, uh, I trust this wasn't a waste of your time. If you do decide to pick up the, the game uh, on Steam or wherever else it might be sold, uh, the $20 seems like a great value if that's what the final release is going to look like. But thank you all for watching.